Hello, and welcome to another episode of Physio Chats, a Singapore Physiotherapy Association podcast. Today, our host, Mr. Kieran Phillips, Senior Physiotherapist at Heartland Rehab Singapore, is joined by Ms. Ip Wan Hui, Senior Physiotherapist at the Singapore General Hospital, and Ms. Prit Singh, Director and Physiotherapist at Embrace Physiotherapy Singapore. They discuss the topic of physiotherapy in women's health. Hi, hello everybody and welcome to Physio Chats Episode 2. My name is Kieran. I work with the Musculoskeletal Special Interest Group and I'm uh, very happy to be joined today by two very qualified, very experienced women's health therapists. We have with us today uh, Wan Hui from uh, SGH and uh, Preet from Embrace Physiotherapy. And they're going to be telling us about women's health therapy, uh, why it's relevant to non-women's health therapists and what we should be looking out for in our general population. Uh, so if we can just get them to introduce ourselves first. So uh, let's start with you, Wan Wei. Um, hello. So um, my name is Wan obviously. I work at SGH. <laughs> I graduated back in 2010 and I've been working at SGH since. Um, I developed an interest in women's health, I think, back in my poly days. Um, I was fortunate enough to then do my um, undergraduate program at Curtin, where they did have, um, I, I think, quite a comprehensive coverage on um, women's health. Uh, I think they called it gender health then. Um, so after that, when I returned to SGH, I started in the women's health and pediatrics team in 2012. Um, so then I had a nice exposure to the neonates uh, department as well as then coming back to the um, ONG department where I have kind of pretty much been covering till today. So um, I completed my master's in pelvic health and continence in 2019. So I'm currently um, running a pelvic health clinic. So a big proportion of the um, clients I see are women. Um, but I do actually uh, treat men as well. So not just women's health, but, but pelvic health in general. Yeah, so that's who I am. Lovely. Uh, thanks for the info. Uh, Preet, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Certainly. So, uh, hi, my name's Preet. Uh, I've been a physio since 2007. I uh, graduated from the University of Sydney. I worked in Sydney and Melbourne uh, in tertiary institutions where I actually predominantly covered um, cardiorespiratory wards. Moved to Singapore in 2011 where I started working at SGH and that's where I met Wan Hui. And uh, after that, went on mat leave and by default recognised that I needed the assistance of the women's health physio in my uh, postnatal recovery and through personal experience that's how I learned more about women's self or pelvic floor physiotherapy and that naturally led me to go down a bit of a rabbit warren and, and learn more about pelvic health and how we can help um, women across the lifespan. So I completed my grad cert um, in women's health and continence in 2020. It took me two years to complete part-time uh, and Consequently, during that time, I decided to venture out on my own and start my own private practice called Embrace Physiotherapy, where I predominantly treat women. Well, actually, I only treat women. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about me. So there's, so there's a bit of a difference, you'd say, in, in both your practice, whereas Wan Hui is, is doing more sort of generalised pelvic health because she's also seeing men, whereas you only see women, right? Yeah, I've decided to... Um, practice in my area of strengths and interest. Uh, going, undertaking uh, postgraduate studies actually exposes you to not only women's health, uh, but also pelvic health in general. So addressing men's needs through the lifespan as well as pediatrics. And definitely in Singapore, we have come to realize that there's not enough exposure or coverage in all three areas um, that uh, pelvic health, well, that physiotherapy could address unfortunately and I think COVID hasn't made that any easier either with an inability to be able to leave Singapore to actually embark on tertiary studies to further develop as clinicians. And it, I think it was really great as well that you mentioned that after you had uh, one of your children that that kind of inspired you to get into uh, into women's health therapy. What was the, the sort of trigger for you one way? What was your inspiration to to move into this field? Mm. 
I think strangely enough, um, I developed an interest in when I was very young, I think when I was 18, I don't know. I liked all things applicable, being a woman, you know. <laughs> I thought like, mm-hmm, I should um, learn about this since, you know, the one in three women are going to develop um, incontinence in their lifetime. Might as well be the one treating myself. Um, so yeah, it just happened that um, the undergraduate program at Curtin just gave me enough exposure to go like, mm-hmm, I think this is really something that I like. And um, just well enough in SGH, there are, we, we have this um, speciality area where I could, you know, learn from seniors as well. So I think that was, in the end, I was like, yes, I think I found my calling. So it was really that undergraduate exposure that, that first sort of tickled your interest, was it? Yeah. And where did you do your undergraduate pre? Was you at Curtin as well? Or? No, I was actually, I actually am a um, exercise sports science graduate. So that was my undergraduate degree. And I actually pursued a master's in physiotherapy. And we covered or had no exposure to women's health. So we didn't even know it existed as a form. Um, well, as a branch of physiotherapy, having done a master's. So it's really interesting how different training gives you different exposure and I think over the years as we've had more mentors within the uh, field uh, more research to support what we do as uh, therapists it's becoming more and more prevalent that there is a big need to service not only women but men and pediatrics as well. Yeah that, that's very interesting because I mean I trained in the UK and I didn't do any there was no exposure to women's health uh, as far as I'm aware, definitely not for me, but even for, I think, the women in, in my cohort as well. I don't think there was any any exposure on, on undergraduate training, which is interesting. I think the guys at Curtin are doing a good job then. That's nice. So what, what, what's a, a typical clinical day like then for, for a women's health therapist? What, what, what are the main conditions that you see? What are the, what are the common things that affect women for, for, uh, that, that would require you to see a women's health therapist? Um, so by way of example, at my clinic, um, where I only treat women, typically it's postnatal women who present with abdominal separation, so diastasis recti abdominis or DRAM. Uh, and then also these particular women will also seek advice on their pelvic floor health pertaining to return to exercise and movement in the postnatal period. So typically that's what brings a lot of patients to my clinic seeking that advice and guidance on how to return or recover postnatally. Uh, some of these women will also seek further advice on things like block ducts and mastitis, uh, using non-invasive um, techniques to help address those lactational issues. Uh, we also see a lot of women who present with the typical uh, pelvic girdle pain, um, lower back pain, thoracic pain, rib pain, for example. Uh, women who present with changes to their bladder and bowel function, so things like constipation, urinary incontinence, um, urgency. Um, beyond just being pregnant or postnatal, we see women who are perhaps even younger or older who present with similar issues. Um, with regards to changes to their bladder and bowel dysfunction. So I see a lot of uh, urinary incontinence, uh, women who present with something called bladder pain syndrome, um, more so towards pelvic pain or persistent pelvic pain, um, what we probably more familiar with as being called vaginismus and, and or uh, dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse. And vaginismus is the difficulties with penetration, whether that's the penis, pap smear or a tampon um, and then we do see girls who present with endometriosis the ones that have been fortunate enough to be diagnosed and have been um, educated um, on you know the benefits of pelvic floor physiotherapy helping them in their um, management of their you know their monthly concerns and then we do see women who um pre and post op particularly gynae surgery. So, you know, um, hysterectomies, for example, whether that's for cancerous or non-cancerous uh, reasons, um, pre and post urological um, surgeries. I'm, I'm sure one way can elaborate more on the relevance of pelvic floor physiotherapy turning to men, particularly pre and post prostatectomy, for example. And then we see a host of other issues that we can help manage um, with regards to um, 
prolapse and, um, you know, hemorrhoids and things along those lines. But I'm sure one way you can elaborate a bit further there. That, that's quite yeah. that's quite a list. Um, yeah. I mean, I certainly wasn't aware that you was <laughs> that there was so much, to be honest. Um, yeah. But as an MSK practitioner, there's, there's typically a big difference between what we would see within general MSK in private practice to what the public system would see within MSK uh, within MSK therapy. Is that the same within within women's health one way? Yes. Um, so generally, my population, um, the postpartum population that comes to me, uh, unfortunately, are ladies who experience more severe continence issues. Um, it is not something that is typically screened at the postnatal um, follow-up. Uh, I think the awareness in the local population is not really there. Um, it's unfortunate, but we did a little study in the patient population in SGH. Uh, I think 60% of the respondents thought that it was normal to leak once they have had a baby. Um, they have been told by their doctors that it will go away. Um, I did a one-year follow-up study with um, our population and 30% uh, of them are still leaking one year after the delivery. So uh, we, I do get them pretty late. I would say maybe six months to a year after delivery and they would have been suffering um, fairly severe <laughs> forms of incontinence. Uh, I do actually run a joint clinic with a urogynecologist. So we actually identify ladies that um, are at higher risk of developing incontinence. So if they have de um, delivered with instrumentation or they've had severe perineal tears, then we actually uh, identify them for follow-up. So that could be why um, we see people with more severe incontinence. Um, I see less of uh, ladies with... Um, the diastasis, I think usually uh, it's, it's not quite something that is brought up in the public system. Um, I work through, I think I have more ladies from the perimenopausal age group. So a lot of the ladies would have urinary incontinence. Um, quite a big group of them uh, present as urge urinary incontinence, but actually they uh, they have another condition, like they are retaining urine in the bladder. So um, I will then pick these people up and um, I pick up a lot of urinary tract infections, um, interestingly. And um, a lot of these patients improve a lot after proper medical treatment and then we'll work on whatever pelvic floor muscle dysfunction is could be contributing to the issues. Yeah. And with the men here, we are seeing them post-prostatectomy as well as um, those probably two to three years later when they're doing a salvage, after they have done their salvage um, radiation therapy. So then they would present with um, more like an urgency type symptom where they would go to the toilet with really low volumes. Um, radiation unfortunately also causes changes in bowel patterns. So I do see both men and women with um, bowel urgencies, um, suboptimal stool types. So they have like really loose stools that require some kind of like dietary advice. I work closely with a dietitian, so then I do refer them over. So I think it's a big variety we see. Not many people understand that. I think sometimes people think that a pelvic health clinic is just about pelvic floor muscle exercise. Half the time, it's not pelvic floor muscle exercise that I'm doing. It's a lot of other lifestyle. Um, I'm sure Preet will know. I think we do a lot of... Um, it's not psychotherapy, but somewhere there. <laughs> we manage anxiety and, and stress, right? Yeah, a lot of the symptoms. I'm sure with uh, chronic pain in the MSK group is similar. So um, anyone who is anxious, uh, yeah, especially like with people who have sensitive guts, will manifest then with bladder and bowel problems, and we do try to manage that. Um, yes, pain with intercourse is definitely something we see after deliveries. It's more common than people think, and it's really unfortunate. A lot of ladies think that pain, the sex is supposed to be painful. Mm, yes, so so it's interesting the things that we see. Yeah. I mean, this, this is all very eye-opening for me, you know, again, being sort of a, uh, you know, I, I almost feel like an MSK Neanderthal here, a little bit here and this kind of stuff. But 
I mean, one thing that you mentioned that really, really caught my eye is there's a lot of bladder and bowel dysfunction that you seem to be dealing with. And, and in the MSK sort of, you know, meat and potatoes MSK field that I deal with, that's kind of a nightmare scenario when somebody comes in and there's bladder and bowel function, then we start to, bladder and bowel dysfunction, then we start to panic, right? That's, that's a red flag for us. Um, how, how, is, how do you deal with that on, a, on an everyday when, when you're seeing people specifically for that? How would you differentiate somebody if they've got pelvic girdle pain you know, and they've got bladder and bowel dysfunction, how do you, you know, how do you screen for red flags? Well, we go through a process similar as any MSK physio would do when screening for red flags. We use the same criterion as you guys. So it's no different. I suppose, you know, obviously the big one is the quarter equinus stuff, right? So, you know, that loss of sensation and whatnot um, is a big flag to go see you later, go see someone at the hospital rather than have intervention with me. Um, so I think, you know, as clinicians, we're fairly skilled at determining, you know, what's an emergency referral off to ED versus something that we can manage in clinic, um, just going through the same process as any MSK physio would to differentiate between the two. I think it comes down to the clinical presentation because um, for MSK physio, it might be scary because it's incontinence. Oh my God, like it's incontinence. But uh, there are actually many different types of incontinence. And um, if you're looking for the red flags, um, actually that is more pertaining towards um, urge urinary incontinence or um, like a, something like a neural neurogenic bladder type symptom so um, quite an onset yeah and then you would have that it's, it's the same thing so you would then ask for onset um, if there was any trauma um, uh, you know kind of like around the onset of symptoms was there like on the land on the buttock or the back um, and then we would screen for um, other neurological issues medical issues that could lead to um, perhaps you know other red flags that needed treatment and the things that we often screen for, um, I think my lecturer will be proud of us. What does Irina say? <laughs> Whenever someone presents with urge urinary incontinence, rule out urinary tract infection, rule out um, PVRU, yeah. which is a urinary retention. So, uh, so really, I think if um, the patient presents with incontinence, it's about matching it with the story. If it's a sudden onset surrounding trauma, um, and it's kind of like a leak with uh, preceded by urge, then I think that, yes, is a red flag. But then if it sounds more like, a, oh, you know, there was, um, so the, the leak has been ongoing for many years, you know, you had a fall, but then it didn't result in any change. Um, the leak is more caused by, you know, coughs and sneezes, which is more what we call stress urinary incontinence then perhaps that is something that can be um, treated by a public health, women health therapist. Um, but of course, it can be very scary for someone working in MSK to try to screen it out. But if you follow the usual screening, you know, um, your sensation, your power and your paresthesia around the saddle area, I don't mm -hmm. think you can go wrong. It would be nice if, you know, you had a uh, pelvic health, women's health therapist that you could actually reach out to and go like, hey, you know, I have this patient. Does it sound like something that would benefit from a referral to A&E or um, another physio? Then I, I think both P and I would be pretty happy to kind of be contactable to yeah. kind of like be a sounding board. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if there's any level of doubt, refer back to the GP and put some urgency behind it so the GP can make the call as well to support your clinical findings on whether this needs to be escalated to an A&E &E visit. Mm. Yeah, cheers guys. I think that's, that's, that's going to be really helpful for, for people watching. Um, you mentioned as well one way then, you said uh, women's health, pelvic health, and given that you know, you're seeing men in, in, the, in the public side, is it maybe time to get rid of the whole women's health thing and then just switch it to pelvic health? Um, <laughs> Pete's doing some thinking. Uh, yeah, Pete's no, like, no, no. <laughs> I, I think um, even in Australia, I think um, people are kind of like women's health, men's health. Um, I Personally, I do think it's quite difficult to be a pelvic health therapist. therapist Good at all around. Things. I, it's it's difficult. I feel like um, sometimes I don't do the men justice. 
but I am offering um something I my mantra okay a bit singlish here okay but something is better than nothing I I am <laughs> learning more <laughs> um and and it's nice because um we have a good kind of like support community online with this um, global pelvic health um our classmates in from the masters and that graduate cert program are very helpful um, we do keep close contact with our lecturers so then when we need um, kind of like advice that's where we go to but I, I don't think it's something that we can kind of like forcibly merge because it's it's such a it's it's so varied like men and women are wired totally different, not just in thinking, but like the anatomy is different. So the way you would approach, assess the pelvic floor is different. And um, the problems they face are different as well. So men usually have an outflow issue because of how long the urinary tract is, where women usually have a control issue due to, you know, our muscles having this humongous hole so that we can have babies. And then the urinary tract is really only that short. So um so no, I think um, I think it really should be up to the individual therapist's comfort, interest, um, because the skills required are very different. Yeah, would you agree, Preet? Yeah, hence why I've kind of stuck to my guns and have decided, no, I'm just going to try and be the best women's health or pelvic floor physio I can be because I wouldn't want to be doing a disservice to um the men and I often get asked oh why don't you treat men I'm just I'm just not good at it and I don't want to subject people to you know my you know clinical incompetence um <laughs> for a better way of putting it so unfortunately it does mean that men lose out but we do have um you know uh, a physio that's got a lot of experience in the men's health space in Singapore um that men can pursue therapy from um but also I think one of the other highlights of COVID has been is that a lot of physios is now offered online. So if you can Google an expert men's health uh, or pelvic health physio, um, you could probably get a good online consult where they can do a great history and do good screening and understand, you know, your drivers and um, what you um, are presenting with and then can present to you a, a management plan, whether that involves, you know, follow up with a medical team, for example, where you may require medication or further investigation, or that therapist may put you in touch with someone that may be um, closer to you to seek um, hands-on management or manual therapy if required. At the end of the day, and I think one way would agree with me, most of the work we do is multidisciplinary. So we work as a team. And so it's not just physio, 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 it's physio, dietitian, medical. Um, so we all work together to produce the outcomes that patients need. Cool, good stuff. Um, sort of getting back to the women. Yep. Um, what, what, what do you kind of do with these? What do you do with these patients? Like what, what, what does the management look like? Because again, you, you know, using my reference frame of MSK, all, all sort of MSK therapy can kind of be broken down into, we let an injury settle or a condition settle, we recondition it, we maybe add in some manual therapy, some adjunct therapies, and then we gradually re-expose to, to whatever stimuli is causing the problem. And that's basically MSK therapy in a nutshell, right? Is there a similar sort of mantra for women's health? Because from the outside, it seems very opaque. It seems very mysterious. It's yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think the first time I reached out to a more experienced clinician asking for advice on how I may embark on my women's health um, training, um, she's like, so, um, you know, you'd have to do, you'd have to, you'd be, you'd have to be comfortable doing vaginal exams. I was like, what? I was mortified. I was sitting in a cafe and I'm like, did anyone hear me or hear her say that? <laughs> I was like, um, sorry, what do you mean? Like, you know, the gold standard of assessment for women's health uh, in particular is doing internal vaginal exams. And then you kind of go, awkward silence, process, process. Would I be comfortable in offering that? And then you're like, okay, maybe, maybe not. And, and so you're like, okay, keep probing, keep gathering information. Uh, internal vaginal exam is the only um, way we can assess patients. And the answer is no, it is the gold standard. It's going to give us the most precise information we need. 
but not every patient's going to be willing and open enough to go, yeah, hey, you can do that. Um, so we need to find other means to assess patients. So what are these other means? We can use real-time ultrasound, for example. So, um, you know, whether that's transvaginal or, uh, um, or transabdominal, we can get a 2D image of what's happening with your bladder and pelvic floor, for example. By no way is it precise, but it is some information for a patient that's not necessarily comfortable with more invasive means of assessment. The next step towards um, an internal exam would be an external pelvic floor exam. And that could be as much as, you know, um, placing the hands over the perineum or the back passage and with a patient's clothes on and just feeling for activation and relaxation um, of the pelvic floor as a very basic way of understanding whether they can connect or not connect with their pelvic floor. And then, you know, as a patient's comfort um, progresses, you know, you can take one layer away at a time. So these are some invasive versus non-invasive ways to help assess patients. But back to your original question on like, how do we treat patients? I think the biggest tool we have as clinicians is education and advice. Mm -hmm. At no point, if I reflect on my journey as a um, pregnant first time mum, was I ever educated on incontinence, prolapse, possible changes that I may undergo. Everything was focused on the baby, how to swallow the baby, how to read different baby cues, this high pitch crying means this, low pitch means that. Like at no point did someone go to me like, hey, and by the way, these are the physiological changes you may experience. If at any point you experience X, Y, Z, reach out for help because this is not something that you have to put up with. And this is a, a common line you'll hear us um, therapists um, reiterating is, it's common and not normal and help is available. So often we are told by clinicians um, that, you know, oh, that's normal to one way point. Oh, you know, everyone seems to think it's normal to be incontinent of urine, particularly if you've had a baby. Well, the answer is no. If you're bothered by it and you don't want to be incontinent for the rest of your life, reach out to your uh, pelvic floor and self-physiotherapist because with some good assessment, advice and education and just understanding what to put up with, and what not to put up with can make a huge difference. You know, knowledge is power. And that's where I think we're doing a real disservice to the people of our um, community is that we're not putting enough knowledge out there for um, women to recognize the common versus the normal. Moving on from education advice, we do manual therapy as well. It's just in places that you wouldn't go as an MSK therapist. Um, you know, we can also use a biofeedback in terms of using EMG or electrical stim for therapy. We use a lot of exercise and movement and to one way point, we're using a lot of cognitive functional behavioral therapy. Is that what it's called? That's what the guys out of Curtin, Sullivan and all the rest of it, um, are, you know, putting out a lot of research about moving towards that more mindfulness, patient led, hands off approach um, to managing a lot of these perceptions persistent kind of, kinds of pelvic pain, for example. So um, fairly similar, um, you know, but yeah, not too uh, dissimilar either. So yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I think what we do is fairly similar. It's just that the problem list is different, I feel. Um, perhaps MSK, you might get people coming more with like, oh, it's a pain, it's a tightness, um, Sorry, MSK is a bit far away from me now. Um, but <laughs> when patients come to us, it's more like, is it a leak? Is it an urgency? Are you just going to the toilet too many times? It could be pain as well. So, um, or not going enough to the toilet. Yeah, so it really just depends on what the patient comes um, complaining about. And then um, what we typically do is we do a full screen. So um, the pelvis is only that big. Um, I like to tell my patients, you know, your blood is good friends with your bowels and um, <laughs> yeah, because they're so close together. When one is unhappy, the other one is, uh, you know, likely it might be a contributor of the problem or might be bothered as well. So um, often we will do bladder, bowel, um, if you're not a lady, no, no prolapse screening, but um, sexual screening as well. So these are the domains that we screen. And then we look at the patient presentation. Was there anything, was there anything in the history or um, is there anything particularly stressful uh, happening around the time where the symptoms started? And then we, we nut out basically what the contributing factors are 
pretty much like what you would do in MSK and then we treat it. But because the muscles are different, um, the contributing factors are different. So like hormones play a big part. Um, and of course, if you've recently had a baby or not. Um, so if I took, for example, a postnatal case, um, we could very well be treating them like an MSK patient. We just take into con um, take into account a lot of other things. So we might be teaching like um, breastfeeding positions, which perhaps, um, you know, a male uh, MSK physio might have some difficulty un unless, of course, you had a wife who is who was breastfed and you are good at it. <laughs> and then um, we'll, we'll then be talking about hormonal levels, you know, how when you are lactating, prolactin just reduces the amount of estrogen and then how then that can affect your bladder health and then the pelvic floor muscle strength. And we take that together as a package. So it's, it's really what MSK physios would do, but we just zoomed in to the pelvic floor. So... Um, I hope we can demystify what we do. Um, it's not some kind of magical stuff. It's the same thing. I, I think the basics of it is really the same. You're listening to what the patient is complaining about. You're identifying all the, you know, the local stuff, the regional stuff, and the central stuff that is contributing to whatever the patient's complaining about, and then trying to manage the patient in a holistic manner, just in the pelvis. <laughs> well, you, you made a good point there about... Um... You know, men men trying to give advice on breastfeeding generally probably not going to work. I would imagine, um, and may, maybe that's why men don't really understand women's health therapy um, because we, we're so far removed from it, right? In our in our everyday lives, um, which makes me wonder. Like, I've never heard of or seen or met a, a men's women health therapist. Do they, do they exist? Is there any any unicorns out there? I, I think it is difficult um, logistically. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really. heard of one. There's definitely men's physios who yes. manage men's Men, health, yes. for sure. Yes. But at no point have I come across, I just don't see how that would fly. It's difficult. You would have to have a chaperone at all times. So yeah. Yeah. logistically, that's difficult. And you are already prone to complaints. Unlike if you were an obstetrician, I would recommend many good male obstetricians. <laughs> but yeah, I think for therapists, um, not so much. We um, just spend a lot more time with patients. On average, yeah. um, our initials are, well, at, my, at the clinic I'm at, um, it's a one hour initial and a 45 minute follow up. And if you're doing pelvic floor work with a male therapist, Obviously, we don't spend 45 minutes doing manual therapy, but like that's, that's an intense 45 minutes. Yeah. So, with someone else. No, no I think no, no male therapist in women's health, male therapist in happening. men's health. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I wondered why I'd never, never heard or seen one of those, which is quite <laughs> <laughs> makes a bit of sense. Yeah. But now we know. Now we know. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask as well is I, I've had patients before with like, um, you know, what, what I assumed was lower back pain or pelvic girdle pain. And then they've ended up with women's health physios and, it, and it's worked. But I really feel like it's, they've ended up there too late. And that's that's sort of on me. That's my fault. Um, and this happened a few times over the years. And, and and I've heard stories of this happening as well. And, it, and it's typically from from guys as well, other guys, because we have these lower back pain patients and you know, we probably, we're missing something in the early stages where we should, you know, maybe there's some, some sign or something in the presentation that we're not picking up where we should be thinking, okay, this is not within my skill set and it needs to go on. Is this something that you've encountered a lot of? What should we as, as MSK therapists be looking at and thinking, okay, this is maybe we need to, we need to be passing on to our, our women's health colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just throw some stats and numbers around for you. Um, so in 2017, a bunch of Canadian researchers basically did a study where they looked at um, female patients that presented with lumbopelvic pain um, to see how many of these women are also presented with pelvic floor dysfunction. The number was 95%. So 95% of women that present with lumbopelvic pain or dysfunction will also 
concurrently present with pelvic floor dysfunction. So that's a large majority of the female patients you may be treating. So you can basically automatically assume there is some underlying changes to the way their pelvic floor is functioning. That may be in the form of urinary incontinence. That may be in the form of pelvic pain. That may be in the form of pain with intercourse. Like there is quite a variety of uh, symptoms that they may present with. The other thing I want you to consider is if you don't ask, they're not going to share. And 70% of women will not share their symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction with you unless they are asked. So it comes down to your skill as a clinician to actually ask those questions. Uh, you need to be comfortable probing your patients. 95% of your female patients with lower back pain asking those hard questions, right? So, you know, it can be as simple as um, the Continent Foundation of Australia has a screening tool called Pelvic Floor, Floor First Screening Tool. And basically it's seven questions. And the best way to go about starting the conversation or the uncomfortable conversation with your female patient would be is to give context. Um, so throwing some stats around, look, you know, Women who often present with lower back pain will also prevent with, uh, present with changes to their pelvic floor function. Do you mind if I screen you for those? Yes or no? Yes. How would, what would you ask then? Do you accidentally leak urine um, when exercising, playing sports or coughing or sneezing? Do you feel like you need to get to the toilet in a rush and maybe not make it in time? Do you feel like you need to constantly go to the toilet? I think I'd also add here, do you feel like you don't go to the toilet often enough? Uh, because understanding what normal is also important. So in a female who roughly drinks two liters of water, she might pee between three to 500 mils, go to the toilet between four to six times a day and maybe at max once at night. This is what we consider normal bladder function. We use that as a baseline to determine movement either side of that. So yeah, to my point, not only asking do you go too often, but also maybe asking if you're not going enough, particularly in a female that presents early postpartum because they may be at risk of postpartum urinary retention. Um, do you find it difficult to empty your bladder or bowel? Uh, do you accidentally lose control of your bowel motions or um, accidentally pass wind? Uh, do you feel a sense of pressure or heaviness in the vagina? Um, do you suffer from pain with intercourse? pap smears um, or tampon insertion? Or do you have pain anywhere in the region of your pelvis? These are some great screening questions that will help identify your at-risk patients that would flag a referral to our women's health physiotherapist. Um, and we can maybe add a link to that um, webpage for um, people watching so they can have that at hand. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a very widely available tool. Um, but also just to consider as well, um, it, to my point that I made earlier, it's not something that happens with age. Uh, we've got some studies where they've looked at um, uh, elite female athletes that, have, that are nulliparous, so i.e. never had babies. Um, and basically what the study wanted to look at is the number of women um, that complain of urinary incontinence during sport. The number was 30%. One in three girls who have never had children um, leak urine. Uh, during competitive sport. And they further um, broke down the kinds of sports that were at greater risk at causing um, the, the sports at higher incidence of urinary incontinence. And um, it was trampolining that was um, at 70%. So trampolinists um, predominantly leaked, uh, followed by um, gymnasts and ballerinas uh, and then one in three ten tennis players, badminton players, and netball is also presented with urinary incontinence. So it goes to show it's not just women who have had babies or women that are old. It's actually competitive female athletes where we've got impact um, at play as well. Uh, the other thing that you need to also consider as a um, kind of like a global statistic um, uh, one who I mentioned it earlier, one in three women will present with urinary incontinence during their lifespan. Uh, one in four will experience symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse, and that's where either your bladder, bowel, uterus, all or a combination um, sit lower in the pelvic cavity and in some instances can exist outside the pelvic cavity. 
Um, one in five women will uh, present with persistent pelvic or sexual pain, and one in nine won't, uh, will uh, complain of fecal incontinence. So you, it goes to show that these are not normal. These are, in fact, common. And, you know, someone in your network and possibly a family member could be suffering one of these um, forms of pelvic floor dysfunction and you're not, you're not aware because it's considered such a taboo topic. Anything going wrong down south is like, oh, no, no, you want to keep that to yourself. You don't want to be sharing that. That's embarrassing. It's just such an unheard of thing to do to share this knowledge. Slowly it's getting better. Like we see social media women being quite vocal about their experiences as, you know, becoming mums, for example. That's often where it starts. Um, because let's face it, most women also feel like, you know, everyone's had access to everything. What's, what's the point of holding back? <laughs> I'm not ashamed of anything anymore. Um, and so that conversation and dialogue is happening uh, more often these days. Um, so, yeah, look, I think, you know, our job as clinicians is to recognise that there is a high concurrent incidence of pelvic floor dysfunction in women, particularly who um, present with lower back pain. Uh, and you should be asking those questions. I think maybe just to add on, um, I guess because we, I work closely with my MSK colleagues, um, you know, um, and I really see the benefit of having um, the support of my MSK colleagues in treating mm -hmm. um, people who have low back pain and concurrent like bladder issues because my appointment slots are 45 minutes and I often find that 45 minutes is quite kind of just enough for me to treat the bladder, bowel, sexual anxiety issues. Um, and of course, um, I'm not as practiced as my MSK colleagues in terms of panel therapy and stuff like that. So um, the, just the things to look out for would be, it's kind of like any advice you would give to anyone. So if patients don't seem to be improving, even though you feel like you've mm -hmm. kind of addressed um, all of the contributing factors, then I think that's time to start to consider that um, probably some of the screening questions that Preet has brought up, you know, might be worthwhile asking. So, for example, a lot of my patients with um, pelvic organ prolapse will present with um, back pain, like very big kind of back pain, um, when the prolapse is at its worst. Um, so then you'd be like, oh, you know, I've done everything right. And then why is it like she's improved, but then there's this, this plateau. So then, you know, you can go like, oh, um, you know, many people with low back pain actually do have other issues that could be contributing to that low back pain. Um, you seem to have improved with the treatment that we've done, but then it's just this little bit that is left. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask these other questions that might actually bring to light some of the other problems that could be contributing so that I can forward you on to a, another practitioner just to help you with these other contributing factors. And if the patient's symptoms doesn't seem to make sense, then um, that's definitely like, Sometimes, um, pre correct me if I'm wrong, um, patients with endometriosis, they can then present with that kind of very vague, like low back pain almost, that doesn't make sense. It's not something that um, could be aggravated by like loading or postures. Um, and a lot of times, uh, younger girls won't bring up the fact that they know it's got something to do with their cycle, but it just doesn't seem very appropriate to share with my very good looking MSK um, therapist, you know what I mean? So then if you are kind of like, <laughs> so if you're kind of like looking through the subjective history and it's not quite like, yeah, making sense, then you can go like, ah, okay, so then we're going to screen you for something else. This, you know, of, but of course, anyone have, who has pain, you know, will have all this uh, muscle guarding, then that's when MSK physios definitely can work their magic and then we can co-manage these patients. And that's um, what we yeah, co-manage. We're not yeah, here to take yeah. your patients away. I mean, no. we, yeah. we appreciate and value your input as MSK therapists because yeah. that's where your expertise lies. And so and I, that's where we work really well together. And I guess the other group that um, I find interesting in my clinic that I would like to highlight will be um, people who seem to have lower lumbar disc issues or have mm -hmm. come out from spine surgeries and then kind of tell you like, uh, oh, you know, now um, I seem to have some kind of other problems and then, um, yeah, I have pain, a bit of weakness and... Um, I'm not very sure if this is relevant, but, you know, I, I can't seem to feel like when I need to pee very well. So those are the people you need to kind of like go like, oh, okay, and then um, refer them on. So, so I think generally highlighting it to their surgeons that there might be like a bladder issue um, and then to get them to refer on will be good because quite often um, 
my patient has been told to live his life and not think about his bladder so much, but he can't, he doesn't have any sensation to move his bowels. So he's going basically on a routine we have come up with. So whenever he wakes up, he drinks a, you know, a warm cup of coffee. He waits for about 30 minutes, then off he goes to the toilet in a very specific position. And then he does his poo on a daily basis. So he has no sensation. He doesn't feel anything at all. And, um, and of course, we deal with things like erectile dysfunction and stuff like that. And his surgeon actually told him to live his life. So I think we need to kind of like play um, like the patient's advocate. You know, you have to identify these problems and go like, is, is this something that bothers you? Um, because after spine surgery, some men will actually lose those spontaneous erections. And spontaneous erections are very important to maintaining the girth and the length and the function of the penis in general, um, it will contract and shrink if you don't have your spontaneous erection. So that's bad. Um, you don't need that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think not just for women, but men need to be looked after as well. Mm -hmm. And I think just the other special group would be um, people who have the kind of like diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, if they do end up in your clinic with other MSK issues, because they often do, um, then just to pay a little bit more attention to them as well. Like if they do kind of volunteer, um, oh, I'm not very sure if you're the right person to tell, but you know, my bowels have been blah, 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 blah then um, yeah, it's, I think it's good to pick up and then just to let them know that there, there, there is something that can be done. Um, not another kind of exercise, but perhaps um, a really good routine and then a screen through in terms of their diet, their hydration, how much they're drinking, how much they're not drinking, um, how often they're drinking. Um, and then that's pretty much where we can play a role in, in managing them. So, so then it's like we're doing, we're helping the same patient, but in very, very different ways. But if um, musculoskeletal physios could just go like, oh, there is this whole other area you know, this other part of the patient that I haven't actually known that could have problems, then just being able to identify, I think can be quite satisfying as well to go like, oh, help the patient in a totally different manner. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, to it's, your point about like giving that um, diet and fluid intake advice, I think sometimes there's a bit of a gray area with scope of practice. We are not dietitians we're physios and with the postgraduate training that we've undertaken we have been trained by registered dietitians um, to provide this advice so just understand the limitations in how much you, advice you can give with respect to diet and fluid intake as well always recommend to seek the advice um, of a registered dietitian um, definitely people with complex bowel needs IBS and um you know, Crohn's and things like that. There's so many more out there that, yeah, you can Google that. <laughs> that need more specialised advice. I mean, it's all very, very interesting. And, and like you say, it really is a whole a whole other um, world really out there. And I, But I think it's very important that, that we, you know, that we um, sort of receive this this wisdom from you because, you know, the way, the way physio is going is that we're becoming more, um, primary healthcare providers, especially in the, in the private health field, where where we're, we're already first contact and people can just walk in off the street, and we do need this knowledge, right? Because we get, you know, I mean, statistically speaking, we're going to get people coming in with um, these kind of issues, and we, we need to be aware of it for sure. Um, and I mean, a lot of that that you told me that was the first time I've ever heard it. So um, you know, I'm, I'm really really grateful to to, to have heard that. Um, I, I almost feel like I'm going to lower the tone a little bit now because I've got like a clickbaity type of question to ask you. Um, and it's, it's, it kind of follows on from what you said, but if, if there's one thing that, you know, a, a bog standard MSK or, you know, a hospital physio should know about women's health therapy or pelvic health, what would it be? If there's one sort of key takeaway from everything that we've been talking about, what would it be? One way. No pressure. <laughs> hmm. we are awesome and really nice and approachable people <laughs> so if you have any questions don't be shy email us and we're only more so happy more more than happy to help you out um i think look we need to see ourselves as a team we need to work together we need to get out of our silos and be comfortable with um putting our patients first and optimizing their outcomes. Um, 
that's the only kind of thought I had with regards to that question. One way, do you have anything more exciting to add? Wow, one thing. Um, I'm known to talk too much, so summarizing is not one of the my strengths. One thing. Mm. One thing you should know about women's health is your. We can also <sighs> do rectal exams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing. The important takeaway. <laughs> important takeaway. Uh, I, I think the important takeaway for me will be that um, we really are looking to manage patients together with a musculoskeletal physio. So we're not, uh, so, so when you refer patients to us, we're not um, looking at um, taking over the patient. Like we like a healthy conversation. So then, you know, um, you're addressing, you're addressing um, one problems A, B, C, and then you just notice that there's something going on with the patient that doesn't really quite fit. And then you're wondering if the, um, an assessment would be appropriate. So um, I think in SGH, a lot of um, therapists fear referring because they fear that it would be an inappropriate referral. I don't think there is an inappropriate referral. Um, and I think it's great that you could... Um, okay, so in SGH, I think we are, we are more connected in the sense that you can just kind of like text through our internal texting system. But of course, if you're in private, um, I, I think what Preet is saying is true that you shouldn't shy away from contacting any of us just to kind of go like, oh, um, do you think this is something that would warrant um, uh, an appointment? Yeah, I, I think that is the most important that there should be this two-way conversation. Don't fear asking because it seems very mysterious and we're not scary people. Um, it, referring doesn't mean to say you are going to lose a patient. We really are looking at co-managing. Um, yeah, I, I think that is that key takeaway. Like, I really would love um, uh, discussions with um, other, like MSK physios regarding whether or not um, this patient is going to need help. And, and I, actually, we have contacts where we can refer a patient to um, perhaps... Um, specialists who might deal with an issue if it's not something that requires therapy immediately but medical treatment if that makes sense yeah or like we could refer to someone who could fit a pessary and just uh, manage the problem I mean manage the, the prolapse before we can then move on to graduating to higher level um, yeah okay. exercise therapy perhaps yeah so, so what I like that is it's you know we should uh you're, you're yeah. kind of an extra extra member of the team essentially yeah we'll exactly have, exactly we'll work yeah. with you as much as, as much as possible and you're not you're not an other you're just part of the same team yeah, yeah. we're still physios <laughs> we use yeah. the same theories we are we are kind of like from the same tree just in a different branch <laughs> Can I just add one other thing as well, though? Say, for example... No, you're going to get one thing. You're going to get one thing free. Don't be greedy. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, one thing. Um, we don't get overwhelm people. <laughs> Go on, please. Carry on. Yeah, please do. Um, please do. I was just going to say, look, you know, say, for example, you've got a packed pain patient who you've screened. You're like, yeah, look, this patient would warrant a referral. And um, you bring it up with the patient, like, hey, I think you'd benef really benefit from seeing a pelvic health, women's health physiotherapist. And they're like, Why? You know, sometimes if you've identified a, a coexisting issue, that may not necessarily bother them. Like, and they may not have that same, ascribe that same level of priority to that. So at the end of the day, feed that information to them and say, look, I understand that this is what bothers you, but I've also found that this is a concern that should be looked at at some point. When you're ready to address that, go see this healthcare provider because it may not be the right time now. Um, so always be informed by a patient's level of bother. And that's as simple as doing a VAS, zero out of 10. So, you know, as your, um, the main concern that brings them to your clinic versus what you've identified through the subjective history and, and balance it that way. Otherwise, sometimes patients feel like we're just trying to keep them in the system as well by bringing up all these potential problems that they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so before we get into our sort of final thoughts, there's there's one more question I wanted to ask you both, and that is if, if there's somebody watching this, some sort of you know newbie who's just got into the profession, 
and they kind of like what they're hearing, how, how would you go from sort of a, a junior rotational therapist to becoming a women's health health therapist? What what's the what's the path that you'd recommend for somebody in Singapore right now? How would they how would they get to where you are right now? One way you can answer that. <laughs> okay, so um, if you have if you're in a, an institute where you actually have someone, where you have a public health clinic or a women's health clinic, that would be the most straightforward way. Um, if you're looking at kind of like reading things and watching videos and trying to learn a bit more before you then commit to self-funding for post-grad course or something like that, then um, I think memberships with um, places like Continents Foundation Australia, International Continents Society, um, International Urogyne Association, that's IUGA, these are really good um, associations to join. They're not expensive. They're probably about 150 Singapore dollars a year. And you have access to a lot of teaching videos from a multidisciplinary team managing public health or women's health. So then you get to listen to like surgeons talk about their different surgical techniques. You'll get to listen to physios who are kind of leading in their field, um, teaching you the different things that you need to know about. Um, if you want to look into more physio-specific women's health training associates from, where is she from, Taryn Helen, Melbourne? Sydney. Sydney? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, somewhere in Australia. <laughs> the East Coast. Um, these are good memberships to have. I don't really remember the Women's Health Training Associates membership would go for how much a year? So they've, that's actually changed one way. Um, so Taryn Hallam no longer offers the one week introduction to women's health because that's now come under the umbrella of the Australian Physiotherapy Association. So oh, only okay. people who have already completed the women's health one week intro with Taryn Hallam can have access to her advanced courses that are offered in person or online. Okay. If you want to go through that base training, actually try and become an APA member and sign mm -hmm. up to their continents and women's health special interest group. Okay. Um, I think there's some sort of reciprocal arrangement between SPA and APA, I think. Don't there is, me. there is, yeah. So I think in all honesty, that would that's the advice I'm giving the people that reach out to me. I'm saying, look, take charge of your own CPD, get out there, demonstrate an interest by enrolling in some CPD online. Another benefit of COVID, a lot of information has come online. You can watch and learn. Um, yeah. from the comfort of your own home. I get it. You're not going to get that opportunity to get that hands-on stuff, but all learning starts with sitting in a classroom or in front of a screen. You get that theory under your belt before you're graduated to allow to come in contact um, with uh, other humans to practice that part. Yeah, so um, once you... Sorry. No, yeah, you go on. So once you have that um, kind of like online theoretical um, understanding, if you were looking for some hands-on practical... Um, in KKH, actually, um, they have been offering this um, attachment based, like I think a minimum of four weeks attachment. So um, you can contact them. Exciting news is um, in future, SGH will be offering this as well. So, um, so you just need to email the SGH physiotherapy department and then we can work something out. So I guess what we are really trying to do is we understand that um, there is a lack of training opportunities in Singapore. Not everyone has the luxury of traveling overseas. The hands-on practical component really is very important. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope that um, with SGH kind of coming on board to provide this opportunity for a clinical attachment that would um, allow more physios to explore their interests um, in this area. And then um, basically what we want to do is to increase the patient's access to quality public health um, management. So yeah, I think exciting. There's lots of room to grow in this area. Um, there is a demand. The demand is growing. So I used to only work closely with the ONG department, but now um, urology and colorectal have come on board because they recognize that uh, patients do need um, the, the help that we can provide so yes please join us yeah absolutely <laughs> try and find a mentor do some observation if you can um i was just also going to add there if um 
you have access or are from the UK, there's the um, POGP, um, Pelvic something, Obzangani Physio something, um, POGP, <laughs> just Google that. Um, uh, in the US, there's Herman and Wallace as well. They do online and in-person training. So these are more private things. Um, if you want to have a more formalized university-based training, uh, Curtin Uni, I think they've put on hold the post-grad cert, but they're still potentially offering the masters. I need to be corrected on that. And definitely Melbourne University are offering post-grad and masters. And then the other thing I was just going to suggest is like try and become members of these online Facebook groups where all us men's health physios hang out. So that, I think there's one called Pelvic Huddle and Global Pelvic Health. So definitely like join the conversation there, even if you're just reading the questions and answers, there's a wealth of knowledge that gets shared um, on those platforms. And if you are really, really interested in learning more about um, women's health, I'm hiring, so reach out to me. <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah. Got to plug. You got to plug while you can, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're actually um, jumping up on the hour mark there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna transition into our uh, final thoughts. Um, so I mean, I would just like to say first of all, thank you both very much for actually you know spending an hour on Saturday afternoon to to reach out and talk to the community because this is an area where we, the vast majority of physios really don't know anything about it. I I believe I really do. And I, I've learned so much just listening to you both for an hour. So, you know, thank you. And I hope the people watching this will also learn, learn a lot as well. Um, this is going to be published on uh, YouTube, Spotify, and a few, few other social media channels. So if people have got questions, you know, please throw them in, in the comments uh, below. And um, hopefully we can try and strong arm Preet and one way to, uh, to answer those. We may forward them to them. And if you get time, we'll try to answer. If you've got specific questions, um, also, you know, please do join SPA and, um, you know, we can try and get more of these questions answered, more of these issues raised, and we can produce more content like this. Um, do you guys have a specific final thought you want to share with the guys? It's common, not normal, and helps available. <laughs> I think that's a great motto, right? That's really, yeah. I think we'll try and um, sort of Photoshop that into, uh, into the top, or we'll use it as the thumbnail. I think that's a great idea. The more we recognise what we need to live with and what we have, what we can um, address and perhaps resolve in most instances is definitely a win yep. for all. Uh, one way, any final thoughts? No, I'd just like to echo that. It's common, not normal. You don't have to live with it. Yeah. Don't let anyone tell you that leaking is normal, please. Send them to one way. She'll put them right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. that's right. She's got research to back that. Oh, and also we will we will um, link Wanhui's research in the uh, in the uh, text in the show notes below as well. So please go ahead and read it. Um, it's, I'm sure it's very interesting. I'm yet to read it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read it straight afterwards. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, we're gonna sign off. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you both for taking time to educate us all. And uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. You have been listening to Physio Chats, a podcast series brought to you by the Singapore Physiotherapy Association. Follow us on Spotify and our YouTube channel for future content. We'll see you then.